Well, uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me all right? And we, we're streaming, is that right? We are live? We've probably already had several hot mic moments, but uh, uh, thank you all for coming out for our uh, lunch discussion today uh, on algorithmic discrimination and fairness in AI. It's a big week for AI because GPT-3 has been slightly upgraded and repackaged as chat GPT. Who knew that the branding was so important? Um, and I guess it doesn't cost money to use it anymore. So you might be using it right now for all we know. Um, but we hope that the questions will all come from humans at the end. And uh, we're so eager to talk about this, I think, just speaking for myself, because I think of AI as asbestos. It's uh, wholesale, not retail. It's not like you're like, I'll take the building, but does it have asbestos? Uh, you might ask that in a negative way these days, but when you're first doing it, it's just something that seems pretty nifty. It gets implemented at some point in a process that end users or those affected by it may not be aware of. It works great, and there's no inventory of its use everywhere. And then at some point later, we're like, oh, there might be problems here, at which point the absence of an inventory or a set of remedies is a real issue. Asbestos in the American legal system at one point represented, I think, more than half of the cases in the federal system, which hard to hard to believe, but that was how big a kind of reckoning there was with it. And I don't know if it's going to be litigation, but there's probably a reckoning that some are trying to uh, inspire right now in what are still surely the early days. So uh, we have a terrific panel of people to explore this, including from multiple methodological and interdisciplinary angles to try to get a better sense of like, well, what are the problems, particularly with respect to bias? What might the solutions be? And there might even be a chance to talk about, are there solutions that themselves might or might not run afoul of current American anti-discrimination doctrine? Be very strange if some of the remedies themselves turned out to be something that under American or other laws would themselves be problematic. So we have a great group of people to chat about this, and we have Holly Sargent to lead the discussion. Thank you, Holly, for that. Holly, I, don't, I, I give you a brief introduction. You're an exchange student from the University of Cambridge, Cambridge Prime. I guess we're probably Cambridge Prime. You're the original Cambridge. Um, and you've been studying this stuff for your PhD. And so thank you so much for being willing to lend your expertise and voice to the panel. Anything I'm missing on introducing you? No? Oh, wonderful. Um, and then uh, we'll just hold the mic a little better. Uh, we have Professor Debbie Hellman, visiting now at Harvard Law School from the University of Virginia, where I fear the weather is about to um, not be great compared to UVA. Uh, and then you've been writing about these issues, and I think fair to say, when, if at all, can we operationalize in a sense that a computer scientist could get excited about fairness? And if we can't, what does that say about any of these systems that we use? Not to put words in your mouth, you'll have plenty of chance to explain how I just mischaracterized what you were saying, um, what I was saying. And uh, we also have Professor uh, Sherrod Goel from the Harvard Kennedy School, who's been studying machine learning and its applications uh, for quite a while, also an affiliate of our computer science department. And uh, Professor Ben Green, former BKC fellow, longtime uh, BKC affiliate, um, now at the University of Michigan. I think I'm supposed to say go blue, so go blue. Yeah. All right, the forms have been observed. <laughs> And uh, just as a, a couple situating quotations that those of us uh, putting the event on with thanks to all who helped organize, including Eugene Howe, uh, thank you, Eugene. Um, uh, and Sia, thank you, Sia, for uh, everything. I don't know if I'm, am I missing anybody else on organizing? No, that is good, so thank you for that. Um, Technology Review, I think, journalist Melissa Heikela describes a burnout problem among those who work in responsible AI. The pace of publication, dealing with the industry, and what she describes as the cognitive dissonance of working in responsible AI 
has caused a lot of people to burn out in a field that, you know, maybe five or 10 years ago was not even understood to be a field. Rahman uh, Chowdhury, formerly of Twitter, heading up there, uh, responsible AI efforts, says there are people who think ethics is a worthless field and that we're negative about the pro progress of AI. She thinks it surely can't all be that. And uh, the philosopher Emmanuel Gopi says, companies want a quick technical fix and to explain to them how to be ethical through PowerPoint with three slides and four bullet points. It's our earnest hope, I think, that chat GPT can finally produce those slides, having solved the problem that we thought it was polluted. Slash sarcasm. Okay, <laughs> great. So with that, um, uh, the only other logistical things to say are this is being recorded. I think people who aren't in the front circle here are not being featured, but somehow later an AI-based inferential engine can probably infer that you're here. And uh, is there a link for our newsletter or for future events? And that link is cyber.harvard.edu slash get involved. Get involved. <laughs> kind of an imperative. All right, wonderful. Thank you again, panel, for joining us. Holly, over to you. Thank you everyone for coming out. I know it's reading week, so I hope you're not just here for the free lunch amid your study. And thanks to everyone joining us online. Um, Jay-Z has set not only an interesting introduction and background to this field, but also a bit of a high bar to say, you know, can we describe ethical AI in three dot points on a PowerPoint slide? And so I think let's open with kind of a sense of where the field is. Debbie, I want to start with you because let's just say that you're probably newer to the algorithmic fairness field based on your expertise in other areas of doctrinal law, especially discrimination. How did you find entering into the algorithmic fairness mm -hmm. ecosystem? Um, well, I found it super intriguing, but also there were some barriers to entry in the sense of different languages that um, different disciplines speak and the challenges involved in kind of getting over those barriers. Uh, what AI is doing in a lot of areas is something that involves differentiating among people. So for a scholar of discrimination, it was super interesting and thinking about how to bring that conversation that we have about discrimination law and philosophy into the world of the, the technical types. Uh, was often challenging. I mean, Sherrod and I were just chatting before about a really fruitful conversation we, we once had at a conference where, um, you know, for someone who's not math-based to read the papers in the field and think, I think I'm getting it. I read the beginning part, lots of fancy formulas, skip over that, read a little more, but sometimes you're not getting it and it's important to have those connecting conversations. Yeah. Ben, as someone who is probably math-based, do you feel like you sit in the majority view of how algorithmic fairness is progressing, or do you think you're kind of rebelling against some of the majority view in your recent work? <laughs> uh, I don't, yeah, I would say somewhat in the middle of those and trying to really push the boundaries of what it means to study algorithmic fairness. I was in graduate school doing my PhD in computer science as the field of algorithmic fairness was really developing, but very quickly felt a bit of a disconnect between, you know, much of the research is driven by concerns about algorithmic harms in child welfare, in pretrial detention, in a, a college admissions and employment, but then the actual research in the field in the computer science world is really just a bunch of math papers, right? We define a metric, and try to optimize an algorithm to satisfy that metric, which then means it's certifiably fair. And what I'm really interested in my work is how do we move beyond that purely formal and formalization-based approach to thinking about the broader uh, social and political context and ensure that we're not just taking fairness as a convenient mathematical definition, but sort of missing the bigger picture. And do you think that's been well accepted or do you think there are still people that rebel against the convergence of kind of social sciences and the true mathematical method of algorithmic fairness? Mm -hmm. I think the real challenge is not a matter of people rejecting the basic idea, but of a challenge of what does it mean to do that, right? How do you operationalize that? Can we come up with more substantive mathematical definitions and then just optimize the algorithm for that? Or do we have to look beyond the algorithm itself? Are there 
normative components of these systems that we can't define just with the data or just with the algorithmic metrics. I fall much more strongly in the second camp, but that's much harder to do and falls much more outside of the typical wheelhouse of what computer scientists think about. Sharad, you've probably worked in this industry the longest. In fact, you've been substantively working on algorithmic frameworks for you know, let's say 10 years. Probably not going to be 10 years. It was meant as a compliment, I will say. <laughs> How do you feel the discipline has evolved from where you started with algorithmic fairness, say five, six years ago, it was kind of the first big papers where it is now? It's a good question. I, so even taking a little bit of a broader view, um, I was working on discrimination and statistical approach to discrimination maybe 10, even 15 years ago. And the first papers that we were writing then were getting rejected by statistics journals because they were too political. And now the same paper, essentially I've been writing the same paper for like 10 years. And now these papers are getting rejected because they're not political enough. And so this is like a pretty extreme swing, I would say, over over the time that I've been worked on it. Um, and I think much of it is positive. I mean, people really didn't care about these issues at the beginning. It was just like, you know, rah, rah, internet, everything will be great. And, and I think we've realized that that's not a sustainable approach. It's not a healthy approach. Um, but we're still trying to figure out what this field means. And as, as Ben um, alluded to, the, the dominant way of thinking about algorithmic fairness right now is mathematical. I was trained as a mathematician, I'm a computer scientist. So it's, it's an approach that I um, am sympathetic to, but I've also been extremely critical of that approach. And I, you know, maybe, I, I think we probably largely agree that this is not a way forward. Um, that I, I, don't, I don't see the mathematization of fairness as being a productive way forward, but the problem is this is what computer scientists um, do. And so one implication of this is that it's cutting out the discipline, which by and large has been driving this charge. And that is not an easy message to hear. And so I don't think there's been a lot of, you know, there, there has been quite a bit of pushback towards that, towards that message. But you know, I, I believe that that is just the reality of it, that there isn't some meta algorithm that's gonna tell us that some other algorithm is fair, the same way there's not a meta algorithm that'll tell us if some law is fair. And if I were to say it for a law, is kind of an high roll obvious, like of course that meta algorithm doesn't exist. But if we somehow say substitute law for algorithm, then it's like, oh, well, maybe there is this algorithm out there. Maybe there's this mathematical definition out there will tell me if this algorithm is fair. But it's a, I would say it's a funny, it's a, it's a funny view to have in my in my opinion, but and it's certainly a minority view um, in the in the computer science world right now. Debbie, how did you find entering a world where fairness is described mathematically? especially with all the philosophy background that you have, was that frustrating or was it interesting? Um, I think it was a little bit of both, both frustrating and interesting. The idea that there would be um, one notion of fairness and we just have to figure out which one it is when philosophy is littered with debates about a complex concept um, seemed strange So and uh, somewhat uh, confusing initially, but on the other hand, I think it's um, interesting to think about um, what the different mathematical measures are. Are they're 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 getting at something, and by putting them in those forms, you can surface the debates or replay certain features of debates about what we might care about, and even in reaction to. Ben's thought that um, we shouldn't just focus on kind of these measures at a particular decision point, but think about broader structural um, dimensions to, to decision making, um, which I am sympathetic with. I do wonder whether also some of the mathematical tools could still be useful just to do something slightly different, which is if we think that people absent injustice in the world, groups of people defined by their socially identifiable traits wouldn't be actually different in terms of their wealth and health and educational attainment or what have you. So what, what, some, of the, what some of the mathematical tools can demonstrate for us is the degrees of unfairness of our world. And I actually think that has been one of the features that's come out of this as people look to get the unfairness out of the algorithm. They realize 
how hard it is because actually we're just uh, you know, showing the degree to which a long history of unfairness has had effects on people's lives and on their abilities to flourish. And I think that mm -hmm. shows us that in a very visceral and clear way, the way that maps sometimes can. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you mind if I jump yeah. in here? So I think this is a super interesting point. And there's I think there are two different things that one can conceive of when you're talking about algorithm fairness or empirical methods of fairness. In one, I think you articulated very well of using empirical methods to measure and ideally remediate discrimination. And that I would say is a pretty old idea. It's certainly not um, central to computer science. And you'll, you know, at least economics for 70 years has done, has done a version of this. And I think that is like super, super important. And there's a lot of work there that we still need to do. But then there's this flip side of algorithmic fairness, which I think of as very specific in the sense of now let's come up with a rule for determining whether or not our algorithm is quote unquote fair. You know, not in this like broader sense of measuring and reducing inequality, but in this narrower sense of give me a rule of metric for determining whether or not this algorithm is fair. And that is a thing that I'm personally pretty critical of. And so I think it's helpful in this discussion to differentiate between these two ideas. But I mean, I think they have evolved quite differently and have very different implications going forward. Mm -hmm. The, uh, yeah, another response to your comments, Debbie, I think that that's a really important point. And I think part of what the challenge that algorithmic decision making has raised is exactly this recognition that we can't just rationalize our way into fairness or equality because what we're dealing with often is not just uh, bad data that doesn't actually accurately capture inequality and sort of is biased through human data collection processes, which is a real problem, but also that we have data that is accurately picking up on the remnants of discrimination and oppression. And so you have empirical differences in outcomes across groups. And so if we simply say, well, we can have a, an algorithm that will replace a human and that will have perfectly accurate decisions, even if we could achieve that perfect accuracy, what we would end up doing is just entrenching the inequality that already exists. And so I think this raises a really, and the algorithmic measurement here helps us recognize this as a challenge, not just for algorithms, but for decision-making and discrimination law more generally. And so I think, you know, there's then this question of how do both of these areas respond? How do we ensure that we're not defining good, dis good decision-making just in a sense of being accurate? That perfectly sets up where I wanted to go next. So thank you. Because I think Jay-Z's right, it's been a big moment for AI. It's also been a big moment for discrimination, especially affirmative action. And so of course, in talking about how can we operationalize concepts of algorithmic fairness and discrimination, let's try and operationalize it. So we wanted to work through kind of a hypo to try and conceptualize what does it mean to look at these statistical metrics, but also these normative and philosophical as well as legal doctrinal questions. So if we were to think about Harvard changing its current model and using an algorithm for its college admissions, I wanted to set up the idea of what would be the critical doctrinal issues and how would we balance that with the potential opportunities of using an algorithm, like what you're pointing out, to actually identify these issues that currently exist. And so there's plenty of different ways we can approach this question. Debbie, do you want to kick us off with Perhaps what would this look like if the Harvard case does overturn Bucky? Would this really change the way that we could think about a race neutral policy for admissions? Well, I don't know if I'm going to be answering your question or um, kicking the kicking the can down the road or something. I think um, if the court overturns Bucky, it's going to set up uh, some questions that we're going to need to think about more. And I would put them into two buckets, and there are probably more also, but these are the two that I'm particularly interested in. Um, one you saw a lot, um, actually both of them you probably saw in the oral argument, um, and that is we're going to have to think more seriously about what the trait in, in the case of affirmative action race is. Like, what does it mean to discriminate on the basis of race, we need to have a conception of what race is. And you saw in the oral argument, a lot of debates about that. You know, Justice Jackson said something like, you know, if if some student uh, wanted to write in his or her essay that um, going to UNC is super important to me because my um, ancestors were uh, excluded from UNC, if the 
if UNC were to take that as a positive in his file, would they be deciding on the basis of, of race then? Um, and so we haven't actually defined these traits and the legal system, the laws, either constitutional law or statutory law at issue doesn't contain a definition of race. So we're going to be we're going to be doing a lot of legal work around that concept um, and not only the court's affirmative action case, but also this term, the Indian Child Welfare Act case is also about the definition of race. So I think we'll have two really interesting um, entrants into that discussion. But the other one that interests me also is, and you saw this in the oral, oral argument also, is what does it mean for something to be a proxy for race. And I take it that being a proxy for race is something different than being race. Um, and what does it mean to be a proxy for race? You, we could be asking that just as a, um, like, how do we use the word proxy? But that's, I think, the less interesting way to think about it. But rather, I, I, I'm interested in what does it mean to be a proxy where that word has a kind of normative oomph, if you will. Like, it, think about classic bad, um, redlining and like a bank that deliberately decides they're going to use zip code to exclude minority borrowers. Um, what our, I think, moral reaction to that is, is that um, the bank is, uh, we, while it may be explicitly differentiating on the basis of zip code, that is, that's disparate treatment on the basis of zip code, we're going to treat that as if it's disparate treatment on the basis of race because zip code is being used in this normatively freighted way as a proxy for race. So if that's the classic case of kind of bad proxying, what are its normatively significant features? And the two kind of adjacent cases that I think the affirmative action, striking down of affirmative action sets up are, and I can put them in an algorithmic way, that is, what if Harvard's algorithm um, you know, it's trained on the prior students and we at the admissions committee see what it produces in terms of a class and we think um, too few minority candidates, let's tweak this feature and let's tweak that feature of the things that we're looking at to get a better, to get a better class that has more racial diversity. Um, is that using those traits as a proxy for race in the same way that the bad redlining case is. So that's one analogous case. That's where there's something deliberate but the, the, the or intentional, but the we might feel differently about the moral significance of that intention. The other nearby case is one that doesn't have intentions in it, but it's the algorithm is trained on the data of who were the successful Harvard undergraduates in the past. And the algorithm develops a, a view, a, you know, develops a, a, we develop an algorithm, I guess that's the better way of saying it, that, that picks the class. And the algorithm is um, weighting, let's say, field hockey players a lot. That's a sport that only women play in the United States. So it's going to pick up more women if it does that. Or people who uh, say they want to major in African American studies. Now, obviously, lots of people can major in African American studies, but probably more racial minorities are are majoring in that. Um, do we want to say that field hockey is a proxy for sex, and a major saying you want to major in African American studies is a proxy for race? So, I think these questions about what it counts, what what makes something a proxy for race, are also going to be super interesting. Maybe I went on too long there. Not at all. That's it's super interesting. I think we'll come back to some of the things that are on the raised. But Sharad, I first wanted to ask you, because you wrote an article about the Harvard case, and you described some of the issues that come up as kind of this impasse between deep statistical questions and questions of legal discrimination and kind of what merit means and the purpose of higher education institutions. How do you view the Harvard case? Yeah, it's it's a big question. Um, so let me see. So the so one thing is this this case has been framed as a case about affirmative action. And I think fundamentally the statistical level is not really about affirmative action. It's about the extent to which there might be an Asian penalty. And if there's kind of been this co-opting of the Asian penalty as affirmative action at large for very strategic reasons. But you know, I think it's important to distinguish between these, these two things. And so 
when you think about the, the you know, whether to the extent to which there might be an Asian penalty, the empirical analysis proceeds by saying, let's look at the applicant pool. We're going to run a regression. Essentially, we're going to adjust for a bunch of covariates, and we're going to say, what is the likelihood that somebody is admitted? And so the kind of one thing you might throw in is tether. And that's like seems reasonably uncontroversial. We want to admit students who are you know, qualified to do well in our classes. Like you know, any kind of reasonable educational institution would probably have some kind of bar like that. Um, but now it gets controversial if you start throwing in things like you know field hockey or other sports or you know chess club or all these other things. You say, well, we're going to adjust for all of this stuff, and you know, in particular, we're going to adjust for where you grew up, and. It turns out, if you look at the data, that if you're an applicant from California, all else equal, it's much harder to get into a place like that. And so on one hand, you can say, well, you know, if you run aggression, there's no race penalty. You know, all, all applicants with the same test score from California get in at the same rate, hypothetically. That's not quite true, but let's person who doesn't say that's true. Um, and all people from uh, uh, Montana with the same test score get in at the same rate. Again, roughly true, but the problem is that it's much harder to get in from California, and the disproportionate number of Asian applicants come from California. And so now, what you what you have is this big normative question of saying, should we have a policy that gives preferential treatments to applicants from California? Even let's say let's kind of you know sidestep this issue of is it a proxy? Let's you know, give everyone the benefit of the doubt and say. You know, it's like it's not supposed to be a covert way of trying to restrict the number of Asian students on campus. It's actually someone says, I really just don't want that many Californian students on campus because we have 50 states. And even though, you know, 10% of the population is in California, we actually don't want that proportion on campus. It's like that we want to spread it out. You know, that is an argument that someone can make. And so now this choice is embedded in your statistical analysis. And this is essentially what the argument. The statistical argument in the case boils down to is saying on one side, it's saying effectively you should run your aggression without using things like geography. The other side, Harvard, is saying, well, no, we should include all of this stuff because that is what we mean by quote unquote holistic emissions. And it's been, you know, there's like literally a thousand pages of statistical analysis, but you know, that is essentially the argument. And we call this included variable bias because. The bias, the quote unquote bias, is in what you decide to adjust for in your model. And I think what's interesting about this is all of the complexity in, in the norm of complexity of what you should do has really nothing to do with the statistics. It's just like, should we give a preference for certain groups, for example, based on geography, other things like pop out or, or legacy? Um, again, it's especially South Asian students are much, much less likely to have legacy status compared to white applicants and even East Asian applicants. Um, uh, but when you adjust for license status, admissions rates are comparable to prospects. When you don't adjust for it, the legacy applicants are much, much more likely to get in. And also, um, Asian students are much less likely to have lists. So this is kind of the, I think, what the, the issue is in, in this type of Ben, if I can compare this to something you've written about, where you, as we were talking about, there's this formal idea of applicant fairness, which is really looking at comparing groups, and then there's a substantive idea. And in that, you describe trying to overcome structural and relational disparities. How would you kind of describe those concepts in relation to the case? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, the discussion of proxies is a, is a great segue into that, because the question of proxies sort of starts, I think, typically right with the example of zip code and redlining, which is a very obvious proxy for race, one that we can also sort of put a historical malevolent intention, all of that. Then you have really obvious proxies also, like your presumed major or a uh, sport you want to play. But then, you know, where do we go? What do we, where do we draw the line between everything else that just so happens to be correlated with, say, race? I mean, Sherrod mentioned test scores, which you'd think would be in any admissions model, but we could also think of test scores as a proxy for race. Certainly there are differential outcomes across race. So, you know, so that raises this question and, and Debbie, I don't know if, you know, you, you have a more detailed, you might have an answer to this issue that I'm raising, which is there sort of seems like there's not a clear line to say that these are bad proxies and these are good proxies. Because if we acknowledge that pretty much everything is going to be 
uh, or, or anything that is going to be helpful predictively is going to be correlated with race or other protected categories that we care about normatively, then it seems like it's not necessarily a helpful uh, term or a helpful concept to say we can rely on these things, these input variables and we can't rely on these other input variables. And so that then raises this issue of what do we do when what we're dealing with is not just a desire to make accurate decisions, but a desire to intervene or make decisions in the backdrop of deep inequality across groups, but also when these decisions are incredibly high stakes. This is not uh, you know, the reason that there's such high such debate about who gets into Harvard is because admissions into Harvard has ex extreme social mobility and social prestige attached to it. And so I think, you know, we want to be thinking about both on the sort of upstream side, what are the inequalities that were that are feeding into the decision making process? And then on the downstream side, what are the impacts of the decisions that are getting made? And how are we allocating benefits or punishment in ways that are typically correlated with who's been benefited or punished in the past? And so I think that's sort of where a, where a substantive analysis in, it takes me at least is sort of thinking about these upstream and downstream elements of inequality and consequences. That sets up the next question for Debbie. And I think sometimes from what I've read in the discipline, people feel like the lawyers are the ones standing in the way. There's this legal bottleneck of like, well, we can have normative discussions, we can have mathematical discussions, but what does the law say we can and cannot do? And obviously we are awaiting a big judgment that might change that, but in the interim, what do you think are the red lines and where are we kind of wading through legal ambiguity? Okay, well, the, the clear red line, I think, is the idea that um, absent, well, um, the clear, maybe the, 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 the clear um, legal standard would be that you can't, that if you're going to explicitly use race to determine the desired outcome, that is who gets in, that's going to have to jump over the strict scrutiny who can up the upshot of the current case is likely going to be that it's also just flatly impermissible, but that's obviously a prediction. But that um, leaves open a lot of questions that I'll just highlight too. So in the, exa in the example I just gave you, I said that the use of an explicit use of race to determine the outcome that matters to people. But there are other ways that race, let's say, could be used within an algorithm. That is, it could be the case, let's say, that um, if just thinking of grades and test scores as two inputs, obviously there are other inputs, but it could be the case that the relative weighting of grades versus test scores is um, that how we ought to weigh those for um, whites relative to each other in order to predict success in college is different than for racial minorities. I'm just making this up, but it's it's plausible or possible that the that race is relevant to how we ought to weigh the other factors that we use in order, if we said, I want to predict who's going to be successful in college. And obviously picking that as an endpoint is itself a norm good choice, but I'm just going to take that as given. Um, if that were the case that, um, let's say for black students, grades are more predictive and for white students, uh, SAT scores are more predictive. And so you ought to weigh them differently in order to produce the same outcome of predicting you know, grades in college, even to pick something super numerical. Um, could you use race within the algorithm to decide what the balance of test scores versus grades should be? So that's not using race to determine who gets in. It's using race within the algorithm to decide how to weigh the various other factors. I actually think that's an open question of what the court uh, would say about that. I mean, we can engage in prediction, but based on what the court has said so far, I think it's arguably permissible. I think it's probably permissible based on what the court has said so far, but if I'm thinking as a about a prediction of what the court would say in the future, I think that's, that's probably less clear. Um, 
There was another um, question I was going to highlight, but let's let someone else jump in because it's gone out of my head. Shara, do you want to respond to Debbie by adding a sub question, which is I think lawyers use a lot of statistical tests that we don't really know how to apply. We have balance of probabilities beyond reasonable doubt. Well, do, do we, did we mean 51% or do we not? I think lawyers have rarely truly engaged in proper statistical empirical work. Do you think that holds back? The field, or do you, is that an opportunity for perhaps lawyers to engage better with the field? So when you say the, the field, does that mean the field of the fairness? Or, um, sorry, this is quite a lot. The, um, I don't think it, I don't think it holds it back. It might be your mic. You can keep your hands on. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not shouting. Okay. I think it will be Okay. So um, I I don't think it, it's a bottleneck of the field in the sense that the field largely doesn't concern itself for better and for worse with the law. Um, <laughs> so, um, and also, I mean, I think there is this sense that that when we talk about the law, there's like an American, you know, centric, Eurocentric view of it. And the world is a diverse place and, and lots of things are going to change over time. And it's hard, especially now, to say that the court is the arbiter of fairness. And it's like, it was probably always pretty hard to say that, but I think now it's like, especially hard to think that. And so the idea that we are going to tailor ourselves to one particular set of, of people whose, you know, opinions are, 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 very, very loosely representative of another small set of people in the world. I think that's a hard argument to make. Though in that sense, I don't think the fairness field has really cared that much about it. Um, but I do think in practice, obviously, this is like a huge, huge bottleneck. And so some of the the work I I've done with um, you know uh, uh, civil society groups, um, you know, we're arguing in front of judges and we're trying to present statistical evidence. And we're essentially presenting a normative argument, which is not entirely recognized in legal circles. And this gives us the fact that it hasn't been completely recognized, gives us an opening to say, well, it should, you know, the court hasn't thought about it in these terms before. And so here's an opening to think about it rigorously. And we're going to set the stage going forward, but it's also problematic because there's not precedent and no, no one wants to be like, I'm the first one who is going to decide Fourth Amendment cases based on some statistical test that these random people in front of me have just proposed. So it's, you know, I think this is this is the, the trickiness of it at the end of the world. I mean, at the end of the day, I at least want to have an impact in the world. And that means dealing with all sorts of, you know, political, legal, technical limitations. Um, but I don't think the field as a whole is, is really, you know, I don't think this is a bottleneck, like, oh, it's not if we get a different decision from the court, the whole field is going to turn on, a, you know, turn on its heels and, and start doing something else. And I think you talked about something similar where you were sort of saying you're trying to move more into this substantive question where you're really looking at the socio-technical context of algorithms. How do you feel the role of like interdisciplinary work plays into that? Do we need more interdisciplinary? Do we just need better interdisciplinary? What does it look like from your perspective? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, I'm sure I was actually surprised by uh, Sherrod, your characterization that the field isn't interested in what the law has to say. I think I would read it a little bit differently. I completely agree that computer scientists are not worried about what the courts are saying at that level of detail, but I do think the basic notions and Again, most of this research is happening in the US. And so the, the basic notions of disparate treatment and disparate impact, I think, are shaping the, the definitions and the horizons of what algorithmic fairness researchers are focused on in terms of sort of assuming that uh, you know, disparate treatment is this sort of hard line of things that we can't cross. And so even in debates about different definitions of fairness, typically the one that satisfies disparate treatment will win out over the definitions that would almost necessarily require violating disparate treatment. So I think in terms of the scope of what gets pushed forward, uh, there is, I think, a somewhat loose and maybe not the most rigorous, but a, a general attention to what the law says. And, and so I think in the context of interdisciplinary work, this requires really what I think of as the hardest and best type of interdisciplinary work, which is not just translation across fields, 
but actually fields coming together to figure out like here's this challenge that operates or exists at the intersection of these fields that neither of us could even identify, let alone solve on our own. And I think this challenge is, is really getting past the notions of disparate treatment that, that are really at the bedrock of most anti-discrimination law to think about, especially as algorithms raise these issues about perpetuating inequality, I think shed new light on these issues, even though it didn't introduce them. Then the question is, how do we regulate algorithms with that broader context in mind so that we're not just, uh, you know, there are laws now that essentially are saying algorithms that are free from bias and they don't really define bias. It's not clear what that means. Does that just mean algorithms that are free from a particular type of disparate uh, ratio of errors across races, but that doesn't really capture the full normative scope. And so I think you can't just have direct translation. There's also this very difficult question. I have more insights into what we can do as a design methodology. I have much less knowledge, but I think it's a huge question of what does that mean for regulation? What should these, you know, there's the EU AI Act. There are many states in the US that are pushing forward regulations of AI. They're all trying to say something about bias, but what are they supposed to say is actually really hard because they shouldn't just be relying on the computer science definitions. They're, they're sort of doing a mis loose translations of computer science definitions, which are loose translation of legal definitions. And I think rather than that sort of ping pong approach, we need to think more holistically, what is the approach that we should be embedding into law and algorithms uh, as we think about what decision-making should look like over the next 50 years? Thank you, Ben. So I want to ask each of you the same question to wrap up. And so Debbie, I'll start with you because I think that follows on from what Ben was saying. What's the one thing that public interest, government, courts, whatever it is, one change in the current ecosystem that would kind of either push us through the bottleneck or rapidly change the way that these things look at the moment? And it has to, well, so I'm going to say something that isn't as big a change is because it's something more realistic rather than something pie in the sky. Um, I mean, pie in the sky, I wish we'd move to a more closer to a disparate treatment, I mean, disparate impact model, but that's not going to happen. So, um, so something Ben just said was, you know, we don't have a sense of what we mean by bias. And I think that it's important to recognize, so I would like the public sector who's consuming the critique of algorithms when they see, oh my goodness, this algorithm produced, you know, no women got loans when we use this algorithm, et cetera. I would like us to separate two types of bias. One that's um, what I like to call accuracy affecting, you know, bias, we said, but it's exactly what Ben said before that there's some either defect in the data collection or the processing of the data so that what's happening is there's actual errors so that if you care about accuracy, you would want to fix that. And that would also lead to more justice. But there's a lot of bias that's just the fact that we've had a long history of injustice that produces effects in people's lives. So there's no bias in the sense of inaccuracy in the system, but it's because people who've been oppressed in the past have fewer skills and less wealth and all that stuff. I would like us to separate those because I think, now maybe this is Pollyanna-ish of me, but I think when we see in such a visceral mathematical way, the degree to which that injustice is producing effects in the world, that we see that disparate impact um, and that it's not, instead of saying, oh, there must be some like inaccuracy in the algorithm, we see it as not the inaccuracy in the algorithm, but the bad history and its effects in the world, maybe we'll be motivated to do something structural about it. So I want us to, as a population, to separate those concepts, which seems plausible. Mm -hmm. And sure. what's your one thing? Yeah, yeah so completely, Kosan, thanks for that great uh, explanation of the divide between those two things. One additional uh, element that hasn't really come up is just the role of the tech industry in all of this. And Jonathan mentioned the, the you know, AI ethics burnout. But I think broadly, a lot of the discourse of AI ethics and algorithmic fairness is being shaped by technology companies, which have 
a strong interest in being able to respond to you know, deep critique of the industry writ large and particular products by saying, this is a technical problem. We can have technical solutions and it's really rigorous. There's a lot of math. Look at all of these peer reviewed research studies. And there's uh, a real challenge of sort of pushing beyond that and finding ways to you know, be critical of the, the amount of lobbying power and influence that te major technology companies are having in terms of shaping the, the regulations and really just the media and the journalism and all of the discussion around what these topics are to uh, sort of just push back on all of that power. Sure. Do you want to end yeah. what your thing would be? Yeah, and I so I think both of these really touch on what I'm what I'm thinking. I'm probably a little bit more optimistic about disparate impact law. So I do I am equally pessimistic that we're unlikely to get to a place where the courts require us to um, re reduce bias in the in the conceive in the sense of disparate impact. I don't think we're going to get there. But a lot of um, a lot of private actors, a lot of a lot of people can still, even government agencies can work to reduce disparate impact in a way that I think is currently lawful and will likely continue to be lawful for the foreseeable future. And so this is just more or less a, a policy decision rather than a legal requirement. And the agencies that I work with, this is definitely what I advocate for. And they've been generally receptive, even what I would say relatively um, conservative organizations like police departments are still receptive towards these types of recommendations even though there isn't a legal obligation to pursue them. So that's the sense in which I'm, I'm more optimistic about disparate impact. And on the algorithmic side, I, I kind of a slightly more extreme version of what Ben is saying, I would probably toss out most of the technical work that we've done in the last 10 years on algorithmic fairness. I think it was fine. It's like fields evolve. This is like, it's, in, it's like not a, um, you know, it's not saying that people had bad intentions. Like this is a new area and, you know, we developed, with a certain mindset, like if physicists developed, you know, started entering this field, we would have a different set of things that we'll be talking about now. If economists are the one that happen to be, you know, the first movers in this field, we would have a different conversation right now. Well, it happens that when you use the word algorithm, computer scientists are the first movers in this field. And so I think we have gone down a trajectory, which is not helpful, and I would argue has been pretty unhelpful, pretty hurtful for a lot of groups of people, with the exception that at least we're having a conversation. And so I would, at this point, we start, we've talked about this for 10 years, we've made lots of mistakes, we haven't recognized those mistakes, we haven't admitted to those mistakes yet. Um, whether or not we admit to them going future, going forward, I think we probably have to more or less restart. Um, and the optimistic part of me says that when I talk to people in industry or in, in government, um, mostly they have ignored the work coming out of the computer science literature because it's so unhelpful on the ground. It's like thousands of papers that have written about this stuff. But when you actually try to implement it, it's so clearly problematic that it's laughable. And so this is very positive in the sense that no one is crazy enough to do the stuff that we are writing papers about. Um, it's also embarrassing being a computer scientist that contributes to this field. But you know, we all make mistakes. And now we're going to move forward. So this is what this is. My optimistic version of the world. What a fantastic note to end on. Why the slate clean and start again. So a great opportunity for everyone in the audience who might want to contribute to a new field of algorithmic fairness. We've tried to leave some time at the end for a QA. Um, it would be great if we can get through as many questions as possible. So if you've got a question, put your hand up, try and keep it short, and we'll Have a couple of uh, virtual audience questions as well. If you want to kick off with those first, great. Okay, so one of them is: Is there a case use example that the panelists have encountered to help us understand how we can oper operationalize fairness? Also, if they can recommend sources or frameworks that we can refer to in order to start these operation operational fairness as well. Hey, so I, one of my favorite studies is uh, Obermeyer et al work that is looking at, um, I don't know if, if folks are familiar with this, this is looking at what's called label bias in um, healthcare decisions. And so the, the basic observation is that the algorithm was trained to predict future healthcare costs as a proxy for healthcare needs. And it turns out that racial minorities, particularly black patients because of access to healthcare are, um, uh, are, are spending, it's the same level of, of healthcare needs as white patients are spending 
less money and therefore deprioritized in the algorithmic al allocation of resources. And so I think this idea of thinking about what is it that you fundamentally want to predict is in my mind, the most important thing when you're designing an algorithm. And so the fact that that was recognized and, and I, I, you know, I, to my understanding, something's being done about that. Now, I think this is like the first place to start whenever you're designing out. And what is it that you care about? What is the decision that you're going to make? After that point, you know, is this a proxy? I mean, all these other questions stem from that. But I think this is one way that I, I think about designing equitable algorithms. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Petra. I work on technologies used in migration uh, and AI particularly, so this is really helpful. Uh, I was wondering if you can expand on kind of the political dimension that underpins all this. You already talked about kind of normative logics of the private sector and all of that, but also the way that this is often a political project, uh, particularly geopolitically, as we are moving towards a world where more and more AI is being used, particularly on the margins of society. Thanks. Well, I think one, one dimension of that is really what is it that's drawing institutions to adopt these algorithms? And often there is this sort of in response to scrutiny and concern about discrimination and bias. And so, you know, we've seen that certainly, I think policing was sort of the first mover in that. Uh, the courts, particularly with sentencing and pretrial risk assessment algorithms, child welfare, the, all of these as sort of a political, a, res, a technical response to a political problem where uh, various, you know, the subjects of these decisions and advocacy groups are saying, you know, these are, these decisions are biased, they're contributing to either mass incarceration or other forms of oppression. And then the response is to say, well, we don't have to, we can respond to that by replacing human decision makers or augmenting human decision makers with algorithms, which present a idea that you're being more rational, you're being more objective, and that there's a sort of progressive response, right? Algorithms have this idea that you're being forward thinking. And so I don't know as much sort of what you have in mind in terms of the broader geopolitical dimension, but I see that at least on the more local scale, certainly as a core political uh, dynamic that is driving a lot of the turn to these algorithms. And actually one, one other component of that is the, the broader politics of austerity where another response is about, we don't have enough people, we don't have enough resources to hire more people. So there's the idea, you know, we have to find ways to make these decisions in an objective way with a very limited number of uh, resources to actually do that. So I think that the, the austerity that many government agencies are facing is another turn, reason motivation to turn to these systems. Typically it ends up costing far more then it saves them, but. Hi, um, my name is Lucy. I'm a current undergrad studying CS and math and really interested in algorithmic fairness. Um, my question is sort of on like the metrics that we were discussing. Um, so you guys were suggesting maybe it's time for us to move beyond just looking at metric. For example, there are like so many group fairness metrics out there. So what are some concrete things um, that as computer scientists can do um, if they're if they don't now they don't have a metric to look at? Oh, this is not something I can just reduce. Thank you. Um, so okay, I'll, I'll I'll try to answer. So I think the the way you approach this question is say, what can one do? to help move this field forward. But I think the problem is once you frame it as a computer scientist, then I think we start getting into trouble. And so the answer might be not a lot, right? And that is an answer. I'm not saying that is the answer, but I think we have to be open to that answer or else we end up in this kind of funny place where we're saying, where we end up doing things that are convenient that are not actually pushing the field forward. And so now with that being said, I, mean, I, I, I think there are, interesting technical problems open. I don't think they're of the form, here is a new metric, or here is a new meta algorithm to evaluate all these other algorithms. Um, but one thing, for example, that we're doing is we are, uh, uh, we're trying to do ride allocation in, in Santa Clara County for people who have upcoming court dates. And we want to, we want to figure out a way to allocate these things in an equitable, quote unquote, equitable manner because if you miss your court date, then all of a sudden you're going to be jailed or a bench warrant won't be issued and all sorts of bad stuff happens. And so there's a technical problem there. How do you kind of learn efficiently in this noisy environment? And how do you 
in the end of the day, allocate these resources. And so, you know, that's like, so we can use these reinforcement learning methods to do this. And there are kind of this, there's this whole set of technical tools underneath. But the way that we started that problem was we're working with a group. We want to help reduce this problem that we're seeing in the world. I would be very, very happy personally if the solution didn't require technical tools. It turned out in this case that there is some value to those technical tools. And so that was, you know, fine for us. But I, I that's my first recommendation for everyone who's interested in this field is frame the question is what can we do to make this to, to lead to better outcomes, not what can you do from your particular skill set to make these better outcomes? Because the answer just really might not be there. Like it, it just might be a bad fit depending on on exactly what the problem is. Good question about that. Hi, I'll stand up so you can see me. Hi, I'm Maddie. I'm a first year law student. I used to work in the British government on some of these questions. Um, and in thinking through the procurement of algorithmic tools from the government perspective, um, the question was often already, should the algorithm be used? Um, which is kind of speaking to your point, Sharad, of that being kind of a narrow policy question to begin with. So what are kind of practical reframes that we can give to policymakers who are procuring these tools or companies um, to stop kind of starting at the algorithmic question and starting at a different question of, does it even make sense to use this tool? Is it costly? Is the evaluation of its use going to be costly? Like what are some sub questions we want to be asking those looking to use these tools? I don't know if I'm the one with the most to say about that, but um, I think, Maddie, that you're on the relevant questions. I mean, I, I think you have to think about what, I mean, this is just back to what Sherrod said about what is it you're trying to achieve? And given what you're trying to achieve, what are the various types of tools you could bring to bear? One of which might be a kind of algorithmic tool, but there are other ones. And sometimes that's gonna be helpful and sometimes it's not. And uh, there are gonna be pluses and minuses to the various types of interventions you could bring to bear. I mean, I think there is a way in which these tools are trendy and fun and so they, they get to the top of the list, but sometimes they're helpful probably and sometimes they're not. So one more question here. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm um, a technologist in residence at Will downstairs, the Library Innovation Lab. Hmm. Excuse me. Um, so one of the things that I've been reading about algorithmic fairness and influence is that in an attempt to combat the effects, there have been a lot of calls for transparency. And I think this gets to your point as well of if you make it clear what you're trying to select for, then at least people have the option to use it or not. Um, however, with some of these AI tools, you know, as they're learning, machine learning, that kind of thing, it, I've seen a counter argument, like transparency is impossible in this situation. You can say what you were initially aiming for, but you can't necessarily say where you ended up. What, how would you all kind of try to address this issue? Yeah, I think you're, you know, even in your, your question, you're sort of getting at, I think, the importance of breaking down what Transparency can mean many different things, and I think generally I'm I'm somewhat I'm skeptical of the calls for transparency as the primary solution. I think in a lot of settings it can provide a false sense of security. Certainly, when you provide transparency to the decision makers using algorithms, it tends not to help. Uh, often, the transparency can lead to you know it can be the the system can be quite complex. It can be hard to really understand what's going on. So I think. You know, you really want to be pointing transparency at the, the key places. Part of that would be uh, also not just about the technical system and the data, but also about the process itself, right? You might have great transparency about an algorithm and a data set, but no transparency sort of to the prior question about procurement on who's developing this system, who's responsible for it if it fails, who decided this was a good idea. And I think opening up some of those elements as well, not transparency just into the technical system, but transparency into the, and transparency tied to democratic decision-making and oversight, ideally around the, the procurement process and the decision-making process and the types of outputs and the, the types of evaluations that have been made uh, in a way that is meant to be actionable for public response is sort of the, the place that I would 
uh, go with, with the idea of you know, what transparency can be good for given its limits. Um, we have one more question for the virtual audience if you don't mind. Um, this individual works on the issue of online extremism and is developing content moderation algorithms that aim to optimize fairness and accuracy to avoid discrimination against marginalized groups. Um, but in your opinions, what is this individual missing when focusing algorithmic training on the optimization of mathematical fairness in a context where algorithms need to be fair towards race, gender, and all other marginalized identity groups? I just, uh, yeah, that, yeah, exactly. But that's, uh, I mean, just as we were discussing earlier that um, people use the term bias to mean so many different things. It's hard to know what to, what, what that question is getting at because implicit under there is some conception of what fairness to marginalized groups means. And so obviously people have different views about that. So we'd have to know what, you know, one, what, what I think the questioner is getting at is avoiding disparate impact. And then the question is, um, what can we do to minimize disparate impact? And I would agree with Sharab that a lot of private actors in my limited experience uh, are actually motivated to, um, to try to lessen disparate impact. And so it's interesting to think about how you can use you know, the, the idea of kind of tweaking the dial on other features that you're looking at to minimize disparate impact. And if that's what the questioner means by unfairness, I think that's what you would aim to do. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the questions. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much to our panelists. And of course, as always, to Beckham Klein Center, to Professor Zitran, Eugene Ha, Sia, and many others who've been able to put this together today. I hope this sparks many conversations to come. Obviously, we're asking some big questions, so this is really just sort of scraping the surface. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.